Uh, so, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Savo Bakhtiar. Uh, I'm the coordinator at 5.1 Labs. Uh, just to give you a brief about our organization, uh, 5.1 Labs is a startup incubator. So basically what we do, we help uh, refugees and conflict affected entrepreneurs with, to launch and uh, start their businesses. And how we do that is through our trainings, our mentorship and this amazing community that we have that's uh, filled with uh, entrepreneurs and business people. Um, today we are presenting experience and problem solving webinar. Uh, just presented by Josh Williams. Uh, Josh is actually a product manager at Starbucks. Um, he leads the iOS, Android, and like web efforts to acquire and onboard new customers to Starbucks' uh, digital ecosystem. And he actually has uh, experience and he worked as a strategy and technology consultant uh, for healthcare and government organizations. Just if you guys can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, and okay, thank you. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type them into the question box in your Zoom panel, which is on your right. Um, and I will bring them up during the presentation. And we will definitely have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, as you can see, we've been using the chat box and you can type in the question as well. Um, does everyone see that box? If not, please uh, check in like the bottom of the screen. It's called chat. Just click that and uh, you will be able to see the chat box. Um, now, without any further ado, uh, we'll turn the time over to Josh, our amazing uh, presenter today. I'm really excited for today's session. Uh, I believe that we will learn a lot. Um, Josh? Thanks, Savo. Appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Uh, good evening to you. It's a uh, good morning to me. Um, hopefully, I am awake enough um, to communicate effectively. So um, when I was talking with your team about um, kind of what to cover in this presentation, I wanted to make sure that um, I didn't go too deep, too specialized, because from what I understand, there's a lot of you who are not technologists um, and you're starting companies like art galleries and um, not the same type of work that I would typically do. Um, and so what I wanted to do is, and I'm going to kind of click through a little bit. So I want to, so I'll explain a little bit about myself, kind of teach you a little bit about who I am. Um, and then also I will talk about what we do at Starbucks. And kind of like high level, like what our team does, what our app is, what you can do with our app. Then we're going to talk about user experience, what it is and what it's important. Um, I think there's a couple people that aren't muted. If you could mute yourself, I think probably would help with the audio a little bit. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about UX, what it is, why it's important. And then we're going to talk really kind of the core of this conversation is going to be about problem solving. Um, and really problem solving from a product management perspective. So I will, um, basically it's kind of what I do from a day-to-day -day basis um, in my role. Actually, let me jump back to the slide. Um, as a product manager at Starbucks and what you you do um, in your role, your role if you are an entrepreneur and starting out your own, your own company. So just the cycle of problem solving. to either type in the chat or to um, speak up using your mic, whatever you want to do. Um, but uh, please just expect to participate and it'll, um, it'll be fun exercise to do together and, and do kind of some hands-on work. And then, of course, any questions, you can interrupt me or you can save them until the end, whatever you want to do. I think we have plenty of time. Um, and Sava, if you can just keep me honest on time, um, I'll make sure I don't keep anybody too long. And for, for a time check, 
are we going to go until 7 p.m. or 7.30 p.m. your time? Uh, we announced it's, it's till 7.30, but okay. if you can, like, we, we, will, we need time for the questions as well. Yeah, so right feel free. Yeah. yeah, I think if anything, I usually end up talking faster than I expect, so we'll see how that goes. Hi, Josh. Yes. S sorry, you're a little bit soft. It's a bit hard to hear you. Um, so if you could speak maybe a little bit louder. Let me double check my mic settings. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and double check my mic settings to make sure this gets according to plan. Okay, is that better in terms of audio? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, sweet. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. Cool. Okay, can everyone still see my screen? We're still good on that front? Yes. Great. Yes. Cool. So yeah, again, feel free. I'll, I'll check the, the chat when we get chats. Um, so feel free to... Uh, to ask any questions as we're going on, you can speak up or you can type it in, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. So yeah, so my name is Josh. Um, my wife and I live here in Seattle, Washington with our daughter, Josephine. Um, we're actually originally from Texas and we've been in Seattle for about four years. And the reason we moved out here is my wife is a doctor and she was doing her residency training at the University of Washington. And what's really cool about her is she is a women's health doctor and uh, she does general inter internal medicine, but she focus focuses on women's health. And um, she actually just uh, a couple weeks ago got certified to do asylum seeker intake exams to help people who are trying to get into the United States to seek asylum. Um, I know it's a, a really big problem um, of kind of a big backlog of people trying to claim asylum and the US is just not doing a good job of processing them. And so she's trying to help out in that way. Um, so really kind of meaningful to me, we both, we both care about, you know, when we heard about the cause of 5-1 Labs, we were excited. Um, I, I'm just already in, in awe of what, what the work that all of you do. Um, so between um, my wife and me, we're just really excited to to be able to work with y'all. Um, and then yeah, our, our daughter Josephine is eight months old now. Um, she's super cute, growing fast, starting to crawl, um, very uh, rambunctious already. And then, um, yeah, so the left, that was a wedding uh, that we went to in Texas, the upper right, that's all of my side of the family um, a couple years ago. My wife wasn't in the photo because of course she was doing her residency training and was working 80, 90 hour work weeks and couldn't even travel. Um, and then the bottom right, uh, that's me and my wife, uh, <laughs> that's me and my wife um, climbing. Uh, it's one of the things we love to do together. So I'm actually significantly heavier than she is. And so whenever she lowers me down, I pick her up off the ground because I just weigh too much and she's so tiny. So, uh, so yeah, that's us in a nutshell. And let's get into what we do at Starbucks. So. Um, these screenshots are actually from our iOS app store. Um, it is a pretty high level summary of what we do from a day-to-day -day basis, all of the features that we contain in our app, or at least the most important ones. So at the highest level, um, Starbucks has had an app for a number of years now. It was actually one of the first movers into the mobile space back when iPhones um, first came out. It was like the first uh, first app that had mobile payment that was actually widely adopted. And it all started from Starbucks gift cards. So you, did, you would have these gift cards that, you know, it's someone's birthday or, you know, you give it to a teacher for appreciation. And when they use this gift card for every 10 purchases, 12 purchases, they get a free drink. And it used to be this physical card that we would mail to you um, when you achieve this gold status. So you spend enough money that you actually um, get free drinks on every 12th purchase. 
Um, and so our first app was just, you take the card and then you put it onto your app. And then you're able to use your app with a barcode to just scan that and pay in store using a barcode on your phone. I think today it sounds antiquated, a little bit old, but back then it was kind of revolutionary just being able to pay with your phone. People were just really excited about it and you earn free drinks and you can see your progress towards free drinks. And it was a pretty neat thing. So um, the first thing I, on the far left is, you know, so you collect stars for every transaction. Now that you make today, you earn two stars. So you earn stars on every purchase that you make and those stars add up to free drinks and free food. And then one of the main features that people really love today is order ahead where you can actually, um, you know, you're sitting at home, you're about to leave to work. You can say, okay, I want to get my Starbucks blonde flat white coffee, or maybe a mango dragon fruit Starbucks refresher, a nice iced tea. You can actually order that from home before you leave. And so by the time you get to the store, it's waiting for you. You just walk in, you pick it up, you leave. You don't have to do anything else. The third thing is pay in store. So that's, you know, you have all the different gift cards, you can pay with them in the store. And then of course, if you wanted to send a gift to somebody else, you can actually send it. Yeah, so did you have a question? I think I'm, I wasn't sure if you were trying to ask a question. Oh, again. So yeah, so you can send e-gifts to people. And then of course, if you're just trying to find the closest Starbucks store, you can pull up the store finder and you can find all the stores. Yeah, that's it. So what I specifically do, and actually one of my coworkers, Harsha Banshali, she's on the phone as well. Um, I'm the product manager and she's the technical product manager. And together, our focus is getting customers to download our app, to join our lo loyalty program by creating an account. And then also we want to help them get to that point of making their first purchase with Starbucks. Um, as you can imagine, when you have features that are so convenient to customers, it causes them to um, use and use the app more often and spend more money with our company. Um, it's, it's what we call a very sticky experience because it's just so convenient and so easy. Um, as you can imagine, if you're rushing, you're trying to get into work and you're already feeling like you're running late, if you don't have to stand in line to get your morning cup, cup of coffee, um, then you can just skip it, grab your drink on the go, and it's really convenient. Um, you know, in America, we're addicted to sugar and we're addicted to coffee. And so for us, this is a, a really big deal. <laughs> cool. So... <clears throat> A level deeper around um, not just what our Starbucks apps app has, but what Harsha and I do on our team with the Starbucks app is, um, yeah, that's right. Trying to make it as convenient as possible. That's right. So we want customers to download our app. So go to the app store or for iOS, or if you're on an Android device, go to the Google Play store um, or go to our website. Um, but for iOS, download the app and then, um, we work on the experience when the customer first opens up the app. Uh, we educate them about what you can do with the app and the rewards program and some of those features. And then when somebody taps join now, they can actually create an account um, where they have to enter in some personal information, agree to some terms of use. And then once they create their account, um, we try to help onboard them. So before they actually can start using the app, we put an overlay in front of them that says you're in. Oops. And it says, hey, we've created your account. And so the next thing to do is to load your Starbucks card. So uh, it gives a customer an opportunity to load the card. And then after they finally join, they land on the dashboard, they're signed in, they have an active session, um, and we give them some onboarding tips of, hey, kind of let's get started. There's three most important things for you to be doing with this app. One is add money to your accounts. One is use your app to pay. That's the barcode pay. And then one is order ahead. That's the skipping the line feature. Does this make sense to everybody? So it's, um, we, we are not, our team in particular, uh, our focus is mostly just getting customers in the door and getting them to the first purchase. There are other teams that work more on making that order ahead feature easier and better day to day. And then also there's another team that works a lot on the rewards program specifically, always building out more and more features um, and making a, different ways where you can use your stars to get free drinks or food. 
Um, but this is kind of the the high level of how what we do specifically. And 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 all this talk is going to be focused around acquisition and onboarding, because um, I wanted to give you real life, life examples of what we have been doing in our app, and you're going to actually see some of this in the case study. Okay. So we don't have any questions yet. Let's talk about user experience. Um, so if you already know UX, just feel free to, to dull me out, but I don't know what level each of you are in terms of understanding of user experience. So I wanted to get, set a baseline of what I define user experience as, um, and then that's gonna play into uh, the whole conversation around problem solving. So let's talk about user experience. So high level, what is UX? Um, and there's a number of articles out there that you can read. Um, feel free to peruse all of them. Um, but really, you, you kind of have to wade through it. Some people say it's a process. Some, think it's a, some people say it's a specific design paradigm. Some people, you know, there's all kinds of different definitions. Um, and so when, yeah, that's right. Sorry, acquisition on board. Yep, getting more customers to actually know how to use the app to begin with. Yep. So user experience, um, the way that I've been defining it is it's, it's a design, it's a, it's a process of creating utility, so making something useful, and creating delight, so making something enjoyable um, in the products and services that you build for your customers, whatever the form factor is. So it doesn't have to be an app. It doesn't have to be a website. User experience is applicable to even physical products or services that you offer to your customer. So... This talk is going to be very specific to mobile user experience, but I, I hope that you can take away from this that even if you're talking about, um, you know, designing a service for notifying somebody to come fill up your gas for home heating and cooking, um, UX is still something that you are doing and that's something you should care about. And so I'm just going to tie this into the visual sides of things. Um, but yeah, so, so UX is, is, is important to understand. It deals with how a product functions and the experience that a customer has while using your product. Now, in contrast, um, I wanna make a distinction of UX and UI, which UI stands for user interface, are not the same thing. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of comparison to understand the two, because when we're talking about digital, sometimes these really get confused. So UX design, again, primarily concerned with functionality of a product. So when you're thinking about UX, this includes the features that are part of the product. So all the, you know, can you create an account? Can you order ahead? Can you order ahead ahead of time or do you have to do it at the same time? You know, all the different features included. It includes the usability and flow of an app. So all the screens somebody might go through, the steps in a process. Um, and then while UX isn't concerned with the specific copy use the specific words that you use when you're you know deciding what words to put on your buttons or descriptions it cares about the core message in the content when you say i want to make sure that this message gets across that a customer has to do this action in order to get to the next step or whatever it might be um, so ux cares about the core message now let's contrast that with ui design um, so user interface is primarily concerned with the cosmetics or the visual design of a product. Um, cosmetics, again, kind of like the makeup, how it looks, the appearances. Um, there, It's not a super clear and distinct line between the two, but when I'm thinking about UX design, I'm thinking black and white, I'm thinking hand-drawn boxes, I'm thinking flows, um, but when I'm thinking about UI design, I'm actually thinking of what are the colors that I want to use? What's the styling? that I wanna use for the feature, or what's the voice of the content? And what are the branding elements? What specific illustrations or images might I wanna use? Um, and so this is a, an important distinction because UI design, um, like how something just appears, is not important to you as UX design. And I wanna make that really clear. UX design is more important than how something looks. You can make a really ugly looking app from a visual perspective. You use colors like hot pink, lime green, um, bright yellow, whatever it is, as long as a customer can actually understand that they tap here to get to here, they understand that this is how you achieve a certain 
flow in a feature, that's most important. Now, of course, UI matters to that because you can detract from user experience by having a really ugly app, but user experience is more important than that. Um, and as a product manager, I try to mostly focus on UX and leave the UI design to our designers because they're the creative folks. They know how to make something look attractive. They know how to make something meet our brand. Um, and so we're gonna spend a lot of time talking today just about user experience and user experience design. Does anybody have any questions about that? Um, I have some examples that I'm gonna go through as well about UX design. So here's a UX example. Um, <clears throat> this is a real product. This is our app. This is that onboarding tracker. I actually showed you on an earlier slide. Um, but what this is, check the notes. Yeah, feel free to ask your questions. What this is, these are actually early wireframes before we actually launched this feature. So it's something that, oh, it looks like somebody can't hear. Might have some speaker issues on your side. Yeah, I will, I will text him and okay. it's from his site, yep. Okay. So this image right here, this is actually something that I, as, again, I'm not a designer, I'm a product manager, but I routinely draw or mock up um, versions of features um, before my designers are even thinking about something. So I put this together, it's when somebody, like here's the feature goal. So we want we want to get a customer to take the most important actions after creating an account. So after they create their account, they fill out that long form. I want to get them to make their first transaction. And so I want to show the first thing that they see after they create an account, they're on the dashboard of our application, kind of two, two groupings of things. I'm thinking about, hey, I know skip the line is important to you. Order ahead, skip the line super convenient and so let me show something that is related to skipping the line and then another feature is pay with your phone that's the barcode pay and then when it comes to the rewards program i maybe i want to get them to redeem their first reward or maybe i want them to um, add their birthday give their birthday to starbucks because one of the things one of the perks of being a starbucks rewards loyalty member is on your birthday every year you get a free drink and so um, maybe on this onboarding component, I want to ask people to add their birthday. So I did this. I actually did it in PowerPoint or I use Google Slides all the time. This presentation is in Google Slides. Um, you can communicate a lot by just drawing some boxes and typing some text in. Um, and then this on the right side is actually what our designer did. They took the... Um, Took, took the concept of what I was trying to do and they made just a V2 of this wireframe. Um, now I grayed out the top and I grayed out the bottom because I really want you to just focus on this section right in here. But they got across, you know, there's gonna be these skinny little cards that show up on this dashboard. There's gonna be roughly three actions that somebody could take. And it's help, helpful to have a visual sort of icon view of things to communicate what this is about, as well as some text. So again, feature goal, get customers to make the most important actions. The location of this feature is the first thing a customer sees af after joining. The actions that we narrowed in on are <clears throat> three. We want them to order ahead to skip the line. We want customers to pay in store by scanning a barcode. And we want customers to actually reload their Starbucks gift card. That's something that's core to our program. You have to reload before you can actually transact. <clears throat> and then in terms of behavior, because that's also a UX component, we want the relevant actions um, to show the customer, but when they're completed, those actions should go away, showing the next most important step. So we, want, we don't want to clutter up the screen. If you've skipped the line already, we don't need to keep telling you, hey, skip the line, skip the line. That's not important anymore. A customer has tried it. We want them to move on to the next most important action. And then lastly, I put here, um, for these cards, I want them to be very obviously tappable. You know, it's an app. If something doesn't look like a button, customers aren't going to tap it. If they don't tap it, they can't use it. So we wanted to make sure these cards look, looked obviously tappable. I'm going to check the chat right quick. Yep, 
Yeah, exactly. So wireframing, creating a very early version of an app, um, or when you have an app, creating very early versions of specific features that you're trying to add on to um, your existing app. <clears throat> yeah, you can use PowerPoint, you can use Google Slides. Um, drawing them with pen and paper is also super helpful um, because I think that the idea here is you want to communicate what is the functionality of the product, not how it's supposed to look. If you can separate those two and just focus on what am I trying to achieve, um, not how does it look, you're going to be a lot better about communicating your ideas to designers and engineers to help them come up with their creative ways to solve their problems um, as they're trying to deliver the features that you're working on. So I'm going to step over to the next example. And again, compare and contrast user experience versus user interface. Here's the UI example. This is that same exact feature, but this is with the UI work completed. So colors and font. Again, that's something that matters to UI. So we chose a dark green for the image background, and we're using the same font and, and color as the app. Um, we have an established kind of uh, style guide. So it's not like I'm going to add a different font um, than what's used anywhere else. So that's kind of already decided for me. Maybe for you, you're starting with something brand new. Um, you're going to have to go through the process of picking out, you know, what are the fonts? What are the colors? What's the style layout? All that stuff. But that's kind of established for us. And then for the copy, for the actual words, we want a conversational tone. We want short explanations. We don't want super long explanations because we have to worry about space. We don't want these cards to be super, super tall because that means customers aren't going to see all of them or maybe other content gets pushed down. So we have, we went from just a single tagline to actually a tagline and some subcopy. So we have add money and it says, take this first step to order ahead or pay with the app. So you get for customers who just want to look at the image and briefly skim over the copy, they can do that. If they want to read a little bit more, they have the subcopy that they can read into as well. For the images, we use this illustration style. So it looks like hand-drawn images. Um, this is a stack of coins, uh, which communicates something about adding money. Um, and then you have the user app to pay. That illustration has a hand actually holding a, what looks like a phone with a bit of a barcode on there. So that's actually what you do. When you go into a store, you scan your, your app um, to pay. That's what that's supposed to communicate. And the last one, order ahead, it's got a, a, a illustration of a phone and an arrow drawn to a cup trying to communicate hey you use your phone to order ahead to get your coffee and then lastly i'm going to show you another ui example related to this product and that is the animation if it wants to play for me Well, that's potentially not going to load up, but we'll see. Got a question from Mohammed: Is UX design user universal across the globe, or does it change depending on the user experience in terms of familiarity with using mobile applications? As an example, Iraqi people are not used to using so many applications, so some functions and features might not get across to them in the same way it does in the US. Yeah, um, that's a really, really good point. Um, it, Mohammed, it, it absolutely does change across the globe. And it does change even on different platforms. So um, when it comes to, I, I don't think this animation is going to load. When it comes to um, just differences between iPhone users and Android users, there's different patterns that customers are used to. Um, you know, on the iPhone, we have this um, bottom navigation where customers, um, in order to navigate through the app, let's see there's the home screen, which is the dashboard. They can look at their cards and reload them. Here's order ahead. Here's sending gifts. Here's finding stores. Um, this is a, a pattern that's been mostly iPhone centric for the past few years. Uh, whereas for Android, their navigation used to be in the upper left hand corner. You usually see these three lines. We call it a hamburger menu. And when you tap on that hamburger menu, it pulls out a slide and you can see all the navigation down the left-hand side of your screen. So even just between iPhone and Android phone, there's different UX patterns that are utilized. Um, there's also different icons that are used. So um, 
icons are very, very UX um, heavy. Um, it's, it's not, that's one of those areas where it's actually how you draw something impacts UX. It's not just a UI thing. And so um, for in, in the US and in iPhones, um, and Android uses this quite a bit, but we use this gear looking icon and that's supposed to communicate settings. Um, it's not always a gear though. There's other icons that you can use for that. Different countries will have different interpretations of things. Um, another thing related to UX is um, if, you if you're in a country where you know, language is written from right to left instead of left to right, that impacts where you actually wanna put your buttons on a page um, because people's focus and the way they read screens is going to be different. Um, because in America we have a like English language is is a left to right top to bottom sort of thing um, we know that customers focus like where they actually track and look down a screen starts in the upper left moves down to the bottom and then moves to the right it's kind of have this, has this L shape and then sometimes they come back to the middle um, but that can change depending on what your language is um, like oh hey here we go here's it here's the animation if it'll play again yeah, so here, here's the, the UI animation that I was talking about earlier. Um, something that we can look at. So this is communicate when somebody completes a feature or completes a, an onboarding step. But yeah, Mohammed, great question. Um, UX definitely can change. Um, you have to get to know your customers and what they need in order to complete the steps of your feature, the steps of the flows in your feature. Um, so you absolutely need to learn what works for your customers. Um, what are they able to achieve? What are they not able to achieve? And then when you find those areas where they can't complete a flow, they, they keep dropping off for some reason, find ways to overcome that. So maybe you have to use buttons in a different place. Maybe you have to use different icons. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's certainly you have, you have to understand your customer um, and that, that like culture definitely plays into that and language, of course. Great question. So transitioning um, a bit into the problem solving, um, I mentioned this earlier, but whenever you're building a product, start with the user experience. Again, UX over UI, we just wanna start with the user experience um, because that actually helps us have a structured approach to solving problems. And I'm gonna kind of walk us through that. So you're gonna see this diagram a few times. Um, a, lot of, a lot of sort of startup ideas, will talk, startup um, methodologies will talk about test, measure, learn, test, measure, learn. So they want you to test something, measure to see how it does and learn from the outcome. Um, I like to extend that a little bit further because you can't really test something until you have a good understanding of what the problem is you're trying to solve. And so I like to start with identify the problem. And once you know what the problem is or the opportunity is that you're trying to create a product for or create a, a solution for, uh, for an opportunity, then from there, you can actually form a hypothesis of what, like if I do something, then something will happen. And then you can actually test that, this hypothesis. You can go from, I understand a problem to I think I, I know what might happen if I do something then you can actually test to see, am I right or am I wrong? Is this gonna work or is it not gonna work? And then as best as possible, measure the outcome. Did it actually work? Was my hypothesis right? And from there, if it was right, great. What did you learn? If it wasn't, great. Also, what did you learn? Um, between Harsha and, and me, we've run multiple um, experiments, A-B tests, and we'll talk about A-B testing here in a little bit. Um, but we've had failed tests multiple times. And um, on one hand, you're like, oh, brutal, I didn't get it. Um, on the other hand, that's fine. We make guesses all the time. We try to predict customer behavior as best as possible. But regardless, it's not about identifying the perfect problem, for, forming the best hypothesis, finding a way to test your hypothesis that true, proves that your hypothesis was true. That, that just doesn't work. You want, you want to like understand the problems realistically. You want to form a good hypothesis and then you just want to know if it's right or wrong. And from there you have learnings to be able to feed into the next loop and just goes around and around. So let me talk about identifying the problem. So 
this is arguably the most important point. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, this is arguably the most important step in the entire process. Um, and I actually talk with our research team a lot about this. Um, first, what is the problem you are trying to solve for? What, or what, either with your product all up, like what does your product do? Or if very specifically a feature of your product, um, what is the problem? And for that problem, is that the most urgent of problems you need to solve for? Or is there something else that's a bigger opportunity or a bigger pain point to your customers? So you, for a company like Starbucks, we're such a huge company that we could be working on a hundred different product projects on any given day because there's so much we could possibly do. But we have to spend a lot of time narrowing in on what's the most important problems for us to be solving at a given time. Um, and with that just comes under, like you have to understand what's your core business? What are your customers? What is the opportunity realistically? What, like how big of an opportunity is it? So it's very important kind of understanding the priority um, relative to other opportunities you could be working on. Third thing is, is this an actual problem your real customers care about? Or is this just something you think would be cool? Um, this is kind of humorous, but um, also a really good point around, um, you know, you might have an idea, you might be in love with the idea. Um, you might even think it's helpful to you, but you're not your customer. Your customers are the ones who are giving you money for your products. So you have to understand your customers well, you have to know what they care about. Um, and don't assume that your product idea is gonna be awesome. You need to validate it. And then one thing, and there's, I'm not gonna go into detail on this, um, but one of the exercises that we do a lot of at Starbucks is we try to understand all the possible causes of a given problem. So if you have a specific issue, I wanna understand what are all the per possible contributors to this decrease in sales or this increase in customer complaints or whatever it might be. Um, you want to understand pretty clearly what are all the possible causes for this so you can go one by one and start to figure them out and identify which ones are the most uh, the worst offenders uh, that are causing those problems. So hypothesis, right? We're not talking about like really intense research. You don't have to be an MD doctor. You don't have to be uh, a PhD candidate to, under, to be able to formulate a hypothesis. It's really simple. I'm even giving you a formula for it. So the formula is if you do something, which would be a UX change, then something will happen. And that's your KPI result. And KPI just means key performance indicator. It's just the thing that you're using to measure the performance of the feature that you do. So um, what is the thing that you can do and what will happen as a result of you doing that thing? And that's why UX is important. That's why we spent so much time defining UX versus UI. Um, and so whenever you're trying to test something, you want to know, um, you, want, you want to, at, at the beginning, out the at, at the outset, say, hey, I'm going to make this UX change and I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. I'm going to narrow in on a very specific change and I'm going to measure the outcome of that change to see if this is working or not working, if it's validated or invalidated. And so as an example, if we want to make it easier, or if, if we just make it easier to create an account, then more customers will create accounts. Um, this is what Harsh and I do on a day-to-day -day basis. If we make it easier to join our program, then more customers will do it. It's very simple. The UX change is making it easier. The KPI result is accounts created. So if then, if then, UX change KPI result. This is very simple. Put this into your, your personal dictionary, your lexicon, like this is something that you should just always be thinking about what is the hypothesis? What is the change you wanna do? What is the result you wanna see happen? And then from there, you can actually test your hypothesis. So you have to, Pick something very specific. So choose a singular UX change that can affect the KP that can actually affect the KPI you're targeting with your hypothesis. So if you're trying to um, 
get more customers to create accounts, it's not going to help the number of accounts created if you make a change in settings, the user settings in the app. Like some, a change to the settings doesn't actually have any implications for the number of accounts created. And so you have to kind of think about like the change has to tie directly to the KPI you're thinking about. And so this is really important. So um, I always recommend find the easiest possible way to test your hypothesis and get your learnings as quickly as possible. Um, so sometimes that means not even building anything at all. Um, you don't necessarily have to launch a feature in order to get measurement and understanding around it. Um, and so there's kind of two ways you can, you can test your hypothesis. One is user testing. And the other one is A-B testing. And I have a little bit of content just to show the differences between these two as well. I'm gonna check for these chat questions. Yeah, so we're gonna go into examples for sure. Okay, so testing the hypothesis, user testing. So user testing is, um, it's directional and qualitative learnings for a feature when you're early, early on in developing a feature or product and it's not completely defined um, or when patterns aren't clearly established. So directionally means it, it gives you the high 30,000 foot level view as to whether or not something might work. And then qualitative just means it gives you the why, like why do customers use this or why do customers not use this or why are they not able to achieve the thing, complete the flow, make the purchase, whatever it is. It gives you the why behind the patterns that you're testing. Now, one thing to note about user testing, it's pretty time and resource intensive. So um, it takes a lot of work. You have to sit down with people, you show them prototypes. Um, they can be hand-drawn prototypes on pieces of paper that you hand out to your participants and you ask them questions. You ask them, hey, what would you tap on in order to get to this stage or what is confusing you or whatever it is. But you typically have about eight or 10 participants um, in user testing. Um, so again, user testing is directional, it's qualitative, you use it early on. It's very helpful when you don't actually know exactly where you need to go and exactly what you need to build yet. Um, so this helps you learn a little bit more of the directional things, which is like, oh, I could, I should, of all the five possible things I could be working on, maybe this one or these two are more important and this helps you hone in on what's most important. Now let's contrast that. Yeah, user testing is always early on in the development process. Um, to contrast that, um, something that we do a lot of at Starbucks is something called A-B testing. So this is not qualitative, but quantitative. So we're talking numbers, we're talking data. And so it's, it's helpful for measuring the quantitative effect of a change veritably, like with certainty, um, to show that one version of a feature performs better than another version of a feature. So you actually show, like they call it A, B, and this is a little helpful graphic. And all it shows is on one hand, you've got a little website where a button is green or a button is red. And on the right hand, you see a, the same exact website. Everything else looks the same, but the button is green. And so red is the, what you currently have. Green is the change that you make. And you're trying to understand between A and B, did one have a, an impact to whatever it is that KPI that you're trying to measure. And so you can actually compare the two and see, well, did more customers tap on the green button than the red button? And you can actually measure to see what that, what actually happened. Um, and so you can know definitively when something's out in the wild, how did it actually perform? So it's super helpful. Um, it requires lots of customers, um, like AB testing. You can't really do it with 50 people. Um, you need kind of scale, um, but you can still do a B pseudo a B testing in a usability study. Um, you just have to understand that if you have eight or 10 participants and you show them a variant and B variant, um, it's, it's pretty challenging to figure out like, you know, maybe they, they tapped on one in a, but not B it's, it's just directional and you can't take that as like real science and real like, you can't have super high confidence that this is the exact thing that's going to work or not. Um, you just have to remember that's still qualitative when you're at low volumes um, versus when you have high volumes, high traffic, and you can say to 100,000 customers, they see 
A variant to 100,000 customers they see, B variant, um, and then you can compare and trust the two. For somebody like, honestly, if you just have a couple thousand, it's probably fine, um, but you're still talking about those higher volumes. Um, and so when you're early on in a project, just like um, we were talking about earlier, um, user testing is really helpful for the directional findings. Um, A-B testing is much better when you have an established product or you have existing features with defined measurement that you're trying to op optimize. So that's important and that's gonna come up later in the case. So lastly, measure the outcome and learn. So at the end of testing your entire hypothesis, after you've already defined the problem, was your hypothesis right or wrong? If it was validated, cool. Was it invalidated? Don't assume that your ideas will work. Like it's okay if you are wrong because customer behavior can be really unexpected. And sometimes our ideas just aren't actually that great. Like we might have something that we think is really cool, but when it gets to the hands of our customers, they just don't use it. And that is hard to, under, like to, to swallow. It's a hard pill to swallow, but that's just a reality. Um, but in general, from that, when you understand when your hypothesis was right or wrong, um, ask yourself, how should this influence my future product decisions? If it was right, is it time for me to build the full feature or build a bigger version of the feature? Or do I need to run another experiment? Do I need more data? And so this is what, these are the types of questions you should be asking um, at the end of this, this full loop. So coming back, it's identify the problem, form your hypothesis, test the hypothesis, measure the outcome, and then learn. Any questions before, I think we're gonna jump into the case exercise. I'll pause for a little bit more time in case somebody has any questions. Cool. All right, so getting to the case. Um, is an exercise, so get ready to unmute your mics or get ready to type in your, your feedback, your comments. Um, but we're going to look at something that we work on on a very regular basis. And this is a real life case study. This is not just something that I invented. <clears throat> so create account friction. So again, we want customers to download our app, to create an account, and once they have an account, they can order ahead, they can pay with their phone, they can send gift cards. And so this form right here is super important to us as a company. So the goal of this feature is to enable customers to create an account so that they can use all the features of the app. And let's look at this form. So this form is what we're gonna be looking at, tearing apart, um, thinking about the user experience of this form. So you can see we've got first name. So the customer has before, in order to create an account, they have to type in their first name, they have to type in their last name. They have to type in their zip code. And of course, email and password. And then we have this section. I remember when I spoke to you about um, the gift card experience. So customers can actually, when they're creating an account, they can ask for a, a digital card that we just give them uh, an e-gift card with nothing on it that they can add money to. Or if they, have an, they already have a gift card, they can actually create an account by adding that to their account. And then we ask for their birthday and we say, hey, you'll get a free drink um, if you give us your birthday on your birthday. So give us your birthday. And then we have all these check boxes for whether or not somebody wants to receive email from Starbucks. Um, they can sign in faster if they use Face ID or save their credentials, their, their login information on the iCloud keychain. And then of course they have to agree to the terms of use in order to join. So this is the form. This is what we're gonna be looking at. Now let me give you a little bit more context about what we're gonna be doing in this case. So the main goal to optimize this form, this feature, is we wanna make it easier for customers to create accounts, create accounts. So if it's, again, we think that more customers will, will join, will create accounts if we make it easier to do so. And that's very high level. So that's kind of like high level goal. Um, we wanna make it easier. Current state data. Um, so roughly 50% or half of all customers who get on this screen 
abandon it without actually completing all the steps. So half of all of the customers don't even complete this form. So when you're thinking about um, like, is this working or is it not working? If you're losing half of all of your customers, that's pretty bad. So I put a big yikes next to that. That's like, oof, yikes. That's, that's a lot of drop off and drop off means not conversion. You're not getting customers to transact. You're, they're, they're not completing the step. That's really bad. And then another data point is on average, it's taking our customers about two and a half minutes to complete this entire form. Um, for me, oh man, if I see a long form like this, it's, oh, I don't want to complete it. Like you're not worth my time. I'm going to close it. I'm going to delete it. I'm not going to have your app anymore. I'm going to move on to use a different company's app because this is just too much. But it's taking about two and a half minutes um, to complete the form. So that's the context. I've given you the high level about what this feature is trying to achieve. Um, I've given you the goal of what we're trying to do in terms of optimizing it. And then for the current state, we've talked about about half the customers are dropping off and it's taking about two and a half minutes to complete this form. Now, at a high level, and you don't need to be experts on UX, but just what do you think some of the reasons are for that 50% drop off? So think about difficulty to complete this form. Um, what do you think um, might be causing somebody to not want to actually complete all these fields? Type your, type your comments in. Don't worry, no answer is a silly answer. I'll take anything or feel free to unmute your mic and, and talk as well. Um, should I go ahead and yeah. let's start? Uh, so in my opinion, the preference and terms uh, are just a bit too much for the user when they get into a new app. They don't want to choose the preferences and the terms right away. Yeah, That's something that I would remove and actually make it into a push notification or make it into a pop-up or something uh, yeah. in, inside the app, the actual main page. Great. Um, so you're saying basically, you shouldn't ask for that information before they create an account. You should ask for that information after they create an account. Exactly. Yeah. Great idea. Love it. And the second point would be the join Starbucks reward. Yes. That yeah. one, I think it's uh, too much as well because it's yeah. not related to really the user account. They yeah. can add that later on and it doesn't affect the account at any point in the beginning. Right. Brilliant. And I'll add another thing to that, Mohammed. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. So that section to me is confusing. Like I, it's a lot. It's asking me to make a decision when I don't know what the decision is that I'm even being asked. Um, and I don't know what an instant digital card is. That sounds like I'm getting a credit card and I don't want any more credit cards. And so I don't want to do that. So maybe that's, that's also a reason why there's, there's drop off. So yeah, two great points. So again, Mohammed said, we're asking for terms and preferences ahead of time. Maybe we can ask for those later. And then also for that Starbucks reward section, it's just, it's just too much. It's asking too much in this form. Thanks, Mohammed. Anything else or is that what you got? That was great. Okay, so then Kanar says, I think I take more information about the customer to know them and know how to make them use in your products more and more is like marketing and smart way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's always the, the trade-off of like, you want to know more about your customers, but getting that information from them, um, it costs you something. Like you could ask them for their blood type in here and you'll know a lot about your, even more about your customers, but the likelihood of somebody to give you their blood type, very low. So it's always a trade-off and a balance of, I want to get more information so I can market to them more effectively. Um, but, I want to make sure I don't lose them before I can even market to them. Because if they don't complete this form, I can't send them emails. I can't send them push notifications. They can't actually try the features that we're using. So yeah, great, great feedback as well, Kanar. Any other thoughts around what, what could be causing this drop off? Um, my comment would be like, there are too many terms and 
conditions for this. For example, you accept the terms of the user, but like there's the reward terms and the card term, like Muhammad said, which can be uh, shown to the user after the sign up. Like I personally feel somehow like I have too many things to read before like clicking the button, which is join you. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So it seems like a big commitment, right? You have these three check boxes and you're like, Oh gosh, am I, am I getting married? Am I buying a house? Like what? This is a lot I need to check. Like, I feel like all I'm trying to do is sign up. I don't, I don't want to agree to all these things. So yeah, great. There's a lot of terms of use. There's a lot of check boxes. That's definitely overloaded. Uh, agreed. And then also Kanar had another, or how good has had a comment having zip code, which is not clear for some people using. Yeah. So Fantastic point. Zip code. Why do you need it? Like what? Why do you need zip code? It's not like it's your address. It's not like we're mailing you something. So why do you need? Why do I have a cus as a customer need to give you my zip code? That definitely sounds like a point of friction for customers. Um, and yeah, so in general, I think summarize it with Kanar's last comment. Um, yeah, they maybe don't know why you need all this information about them. Um, yeah, Mohammed, another point. Yeah. You already have a, a solution you're trying to get to, so I'm gonna hold that one for later. But yeah, so <clears throat> in general, we're asking for a lot in this form. Um, it's a lot to understand. It sounds like a really big commitment. Um, so we definitely have a lot of good problems that we're talking about. Um, so three that I had put together previously, a little bit different, but also the theme is very close to what you've been saying is, we require too much information and customers don't wanna type all that in. Either it's too much effort or they just don't want to give it to us. And then another hypo or another potential problem is the form is vertically too long. And so it just seems difficult. Even if it's really easy to complete it, when somebody sees like, oh my gosh, I can scroll like three times before I actually see the bottom of the form and the button I'm actually supposed to push, it just seems really challenging. So maybe I just don't want to complete it. And then um, to Muhammad's point, um, about this join Starburst for words section, this is a very important thing. We actually ask somebody to make a decision while they're trying to create an account. And we shouldn't be making, trying to get customers to make a critical decision that they don't understand while they're just trying to just get in. Like we can make that decision later. We can inform them about, the, them about that later. Um, we don't need to ask them to make a decision right there. So great job, everybody. Uh, Great participation, gonna move on to the next step. So, hypothesis. I wanna know a hypothesis that you think um, that we can use to, to, to address the problem statement of the very specifically, this form requires too much information and customers don't wanna type it in. So, from you, I wanna know what do you think we can do to change and what do we think the KPI results? So in terms of changes, I've already heard Remove that Starbucks rewards section. I've heard um, remove the terms of use or ask that, that to go later or some other preferences, make that go later or maybe zip code, have that go later. So um, we have a few of the UX changes. If you have any additionals, we can add that. But I wanna know, somebody, can you type in, if we blank, then blank will happen. Any thoughts, any thoughts? So I'm gonna choose a UX change of, let's say if we remo remove that Starbucks reward section, then what do you think will happen? Okay, so the zip code can be removed and turned into an automatic locator instead of any zip code, yep. If we chunk up the required, yep. Okay, Mohammed, you're, you're close. So if we kind of remove some of the required information, it will be easier, but easier is not measurable. Easier is just a qualitative thing. I wanna know what is, the, what is the thing that we want customers to do more of? Because I'm trying, again, the KPI results. So it's, it's something that we can actually measure. 
as an outcome of this. So when we test one version versus another version, we can actually know whether it achieves. So what, what do you think that KPI is that we care about? The key performance indicator, the, the action um, that we want customers to do more of. Okay, we got another. Um, okay, Mohammed also said is if we present each section alone and not as a form that we use, we're not feel bombarded by information required. Cool. Okay, you're getting close, but you're still keeping it qualitative. And then five one lab. So we've got. I, I think we're we're closer now. So we've got. I I don't when we're talking about an A/B test and we're talking about a hypo or when we're talking about just so, any experiment. The UX change is a specific thing that you can change. So I've already gotten a few of your ideas. Um, but I think we've got the KPI result now. So somebody said, if we remove the Starbucks rewards, then we will have 10% more of people actually finishing the sign up. Cool. So this is actually a step beyond uh, a hypothesis because you gave a specific projection of 10%. But the, the framework is there. If we remove that section, more customers will sign up. So if we make a UX change, then we will get a KPI result. If somebody, if we remove a section, more customers will create accounts. That's the structure, that's it. So here's two of them that I wrote up previously. So if we remove some of the required fields, then more customers will create accounts. So it's not about how somebody feels, it's not about how they perceive it to be easier or more difficult. Um, that is qualitative, directional, but when we're talking about hypothesis, you wanna be very specific about this change will result in this measurable outcome. So another one is if, if we implement autofill, for this, these fields, or Mahama was also saying, um, if we do location, uh, we ask for somebody's location, then they don't have to type in zip code, also very relevant, right? Um, but if we do autofill, then more customers will create accounts. So again, KPI, and again, this is what, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm trying to create, get more customers to join our program, get more customers to make their first purchase. So that's kind of what this is all about. Yep, exactly, Majid. Yeah, fantastic. So we'll have uh, X percent more customers completing the sign process. Yep, that's the whole thing. We want customers to complete more of the, the sign up process. Now, should this be a user test or do you think this should be an A-B test? If we're gonna measure this, what do you think is more appropriate, a user test or an A-B test? This one's a little bit challenging, but you have a 50-50 chance of, of getting the, the question right. Got some comments, user, AB, user. Okay, so this one, we'd use an AB test because it's an existing feature and it has defined measurement that we're trying to optimize. This isn't something we're building from scratch. This form has already been out there for years. We're just trying to make it better. And in order to make it better, the best way for us to get quantitative data back is to do an AB test. So we want to know quantitatively how our UX change will affect our primary KPI, which is the number of accounts created. So with a company at scale like Starbucks, a company as big as Starbucks, we have tens of millions of customers. Um, for us, running A-B tests is, is something, it's not easy, but it's, it's um, easier to do at our, our size because we can get statistical significance sooner. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but I did include some links uh, in the appendix around um, sort of a little bit more deeper dive into user testing and what that looks like and some specific examples, as well as what A-B testing looks like and how you can use that. Um, but the key thing is here, it's testing an existing feature, uh, has defined measurement, and we want to know with confidence, quantitatively, how our change actually affected our primary KPI. And for fun, I wanted to actually show you what actually happened. So this is the actual A-B test setup that we used. Um, so our control was that existing form. So the control is the existing version of that feature. And then one of our in one of our variants, we actually had, uh, we removed the birthday section. So we're asking you for a customer's birthday. That feels like personal information that maybe you don't want to give. And we can ask for that later. 
So we, we wanted to remove the birthday section from that form. And then exactly like all of you were talking about, that whole join Starbucks Rewards section, it's got to go. It's too much. So we actually consolidated that, that section into a smaller section that doesn't require you to make a decision. And then variant C is we did both. So in order to know what it really did, we had to do a variant that just removed the birthday, a different variant that just removed that join Starbucks Rewards section, and then one variant that removes both of them. And you can compare variants A, B, and C against the control. And then you can know with confidence how something actually performed. And sure enough, variant C won. So um, variant A, it, it did improve the number of accounts created by quite a bit. Variant B also did improve the number of accounts created, but not as much as variant A. And then variant C, it did better than both of them. So this is why it's helpful to kind of break those out. Um, I I'm not sharing the specific data because I'm not allowed to share that, but um, this was a successful test. Hypothesis was validated. Um, we went from a form that looks like the one on the left to one that looks like the one on the right. So this whole join and service reward section got consolidated to, hey, if you have a gift card, you can tap on this thing. If you don't have it, it's fine. And this birthday treat section, it's not even there. We, we just took it out entirely. We just didn't even need that. So uh, we asked for that after somebody creates an account. So again, um, identify the problem, form a hypothesis, um, test the hypothesis, and then measure and learn. What did we learn from this? We learned that removing fields from long forms makes it more likely for customers to complete the form. And so what do we do from that? What's our action item? So our action item is to cut it down more, remove more fields um, and other forms. If we have other forms, remove fields from there as best as possible where it makes sense. Um, and then uh, test again, measure it again, and then keep doing that entire process. And again, back to the wheel, it's an endless cycle of improvement. So we're always, we're always doing this. Like we, we don't stop there. It's just, what is the next thing that we can learn uh, from this and, um, and just keep going around and around. And that's, that's it. Good job, everybody um, on the case. I know that um, all of your hypotheses were great. All of your, your UX changes were, were great. I, I think all of them are stuff that we're, we've either, either done or have been thinking about doing. So, so good job on that. I want to just open it up to questions. Um, we have about 19 minutes left. Um, whatever you might have, I am here. Thank you. That's a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, everyone, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to write it up in the group chat and I can uh, read it out if you want me to. Cool. Um, so I have a question. Yes. Uh, going back to the question that I had, uh, the first one that I had uh, saying like Iraq doesn't really have that much experience. The users don't have experience and there's actually no way to know if the user would know an icon is for settings or an icon is for something else. Yeah. So you restricted to using the ones that are already in the, in the system. Like if it's yeah. Android, you have the icon for settings in Android and using that might, uh, might be better than using something that's different from what they see usually. And what do you think about that? Like, is there a, is there a way to solve this issue? Yeah. Or how to reach what customers really can relate to? Great question. Yeah. Um, so what you're trying to figure out is a fantastic candidate for user testing. And this doesn't have to be some fantastic very structured usability test. Um, if you're trying to figure out, does one icon communicate what you're trying to communicate or does it not? Print that out on a piece of paper, show it to your friends, ask them what they think it means. Show it to your parents, show it to your friend. Exactly. Yep. Print it out, put it in front of people, show it to people in cafes, show it to, um, 
to young people, to old people, to tech people, to non-tech people, ask them if they understand what it means. If they do like narrow into that, like figure out what it is about that they do understand or what is it that they don't understand. Um, this is where you can just, yeah, work with your class. You've got other people who are also trying to solve similar problems. And so if you're trying to see like, what's a good icon for settings, use that. Like you, it's totally, it, it doesn't have to be something where you have a moderated study and you're in like a workshop and you have like a high fidelity prototype. You can even just hand draw it on a piece of paper and say like, hey, does this, does this make sense? They're like, no, oh, oh, it doesn't. Let me cross that out. Okay, what about this one and draw a different version of it and see which one works and which one doesn't. Sweet. Can I ask um, like, what is like the most trend um, in the UX design industry right now? Like what are some of the biggest trends? If you can share some of those with us. What is the biggest trend? Um, I'm trying to figure out what would be most relevant. I mean, there's, hey, Arsha. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say that um, more than, hi, by the way, hello everyone, this is Arsha. Um, I, more than a biggest trend, it's always to what Josh said, how usability, um, how a user experience, uh, how, how we make it easier for user to find the feature, find the products within the app. So for the trend, would you say, Josh, that the mobile order and pay, the uh, convenience of uh, ordering quick uh, yep. and be able to pick it up at the location, that's more of a trend? especially around the businesses that are food retail uh, and other uh, restaurant type of businesses. So that's more trend and uh, something that a lot of other companies are also following the trend, uh, following this yeah. um, design pattern. Yeah, Arsha had a great point. So I, anything relating to convenience is um, both trending and foundational at the same time. Um, in the States, order ahead was revolutionary back in 2013. Um, <clears throat> that was just novel and brand new and Starbucks was one of the first companies to do it. Um, now having food delivered, having products delivered, that's trending a lot. So actually Starbucks just started having, um, a partnership with Uber Eats in order to have coffee delivered to you. Um, so yeah, delivery is definitely trending. Anything around convenience is just super in right now. And people just want like remove as much friction as possible. And that's what's most important. Um, there's another trend going on around personalization, um, which is using all the informa information you know about your customers in order to tailor the experience to what they're trying to do. Um, or the content to what they, the content they care about. Um, but the one thing I would caveat that with is personalization um, can be a distractor. Um, and when you're early on in building a product and small scale, I wouldn't care about personalization. I would just care about building a good product that appeals to um, your audience as best as possible, not trying to make it like custom tailored and, um, hyper segmented or whatever, just focus on building a good product that answers the, the pain points that your customers have. Um, somebody on Codex PC also had a question. Um, how do you spot the problem in the first place? How can you know if it's a bad design or not according to user's response? Yeah, great question. Um, so in the digital world, when we have apps and websites, one of the things that's super convenient is we can use systems like Google Analytics to actually tag and measure what screens customers see, what buttons they tap, how long of time they spend on a certain screen or not. Um, and so we usually um, do a lot of what's called funnel analysis um, to actually understand, actually I, I did have a high level funnel on one of these slides in the appendix. So I didn't wanna get into funnels, but this is just, the one that I use on a daily basis. Um, this is a, kind of a high level of 
what are all the stages that somebody needs to go through before they actually make their first transaction. And so when you can start to narrow in on what those stages are, then you can understand where customers drop, drop off is a term that I use a lot throughout this entire presentation. Like first you have to educate somebody about your app or your program or your service, your product. Then they have to actually get it, download it or buy it or whatever it is. Um, and then with our app, after they download it, then they have to open it for the first time. And once they open it, what are you doing on that screen to educate them, them and inform them? And then we want them to create an account. That's where our entire case study was going through is getting them to create their account. Then we want them to explore all of the features in our app, specifically ones like order ahead or pay with your phone. Then they needed to add a payment method in order to actually be able to transact. And then with Starbucks program, you have to actually load money onto your account before you can transact. So you have to add a payment method, then load money to your account, and then you can make your first transaction. So when you can line up all of your activities that you have to do in order to get the revenue, this is a really helpful way to be able to measure step-by-step step where is, at what stage are you losing most of your customers? You wanna keep, we, we say widen the top of the funnel, get more customers learning about, get more customers downloading, get more customers creating account. And you're always trying, like when we were going through that case study, it was around optimizing, create account. That's trying to take this stage, this middle part of the funnel and widen it so more customers can actually explore your features, more customers can add a payment method, more customers can add money, and more customers can transact. So um, I definitely don't have enough time to get into like measurement using a tool like Google Analytics, um, but there's plenty of resources out there. Google has a really good um, hosted documentation that you can use for that. Um, just if you're working with a physical product, I'm sorry, it's just not as easy to measure. Easy to measure in the digital space, you can just get measurement a lot easier by the nature of tooling like Google Analytics and the A-B testing tools and stuff like that. So um, great question though. Um, let's see, another question. Is using web application better or mobile apps for online businesses or both are required, for example, an online store or for delivery purposes? Um, great question. Um, I've definitely struggled with this one a lot. Um, unfortunately, I think the answer is just it depends. It depends on um, what your customers are using. It depends on what your customers are familiar with. Um, if most of your customers are using mobile phones on Wi-Fi or LTE or 3G or whatever it is, um, it doesn't matter if it's a website or a mobile app. It has to be. It has to work well on a mobile device, and so that's super important. So you don't necessarily have to build a mobile app in order to reach your customers, but if you're doing a website and your customers are using mobile devices, it has to be able to work on a mobile device well. You have to be able to read the font. It shouldn't be too small. The button should be tappable. You don't wanna have weird sizing issues. Um, if you're dealing with some feature that's really complex, like doing your taxes or accounting, managing your financial information, you're not gonna do that on your phone that's probably more appropriate for a website that customers are using mostly on a desktop computer. Um, but it all just sort of depends on the use case. Like what is the form factor that your customers are using or what do you think is most likely that they would be using in order to use your product and then build accordingly. Building mobile apps is very expensive. Super expensive. So, if you can do it because you're an engineer and you know how to whip something up really quickly, that's awesome. If you don't know how to do it, it's really hard to get into that space. Um, web, there's just a lot more engineers who build websites. Um, there's a lot more tools where you can just spin up a website really quickly um, using a service like, um, let's see, any like Shopify for e-commerce or um, any of the sort of blog or website in a box type services so that like even if you have no technical experience you could build a website way easier than you can build a mobile application so that might just be a practical thing that might lead you in that direction but just sort of depends but also yeah great question and then mohammed you have another one so how effective is educating users in the field or during marketing campaigns to ux ui familiarity to promote experience yeah, so one of the things, Mohammed, that we've learned is um, you wanna educate customers at the right time. Trying to educate too much early on can 
make your product seem more complicated than it actually is. It can make it seem more challenging. Like there's more work. Like, oh gosh, like I have to read an entire manual of all these things I need to do just to be able to buy coffee. Can you just show me the coffee buying feature and I'll just use that and I'll figure it out on my own? It's, it's a dance in a way. You have to figure out like what is, what is helpful versus what is distracting um, and sort of balance, keep hold those two in balance. Josh, this is Alice from Five One Labs. I have a quick question too. This this was amazing and so educational. Um, so a lot of the people on this webinar right now, I think, have business ideas and are interested in starting a business. So if I have a business idea, say I want to do uh, grocery delivery, for example. Yeah. Um, at what point in kind of thinking about my business idea do I want to start thinking about the user experience of my app or my website, whatever technology I'm using? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Alice. Um, I would only start with the user experience. Um, you, I, don't start building. Don't start com coloring, coming up with your color palette or your fonts that you want to use. Um, start very, very high level. Don't even start with wireframes. Like I talked about user experience from like a wireframe fidelity type concept. Talk like there's a concept of something called story mapping. Um, look it up, look at some tutorials, look at some YouTube videos. Um, story mapping is super helpful because it's, it's even, it's user experience, but at a very high level. So from, from the beginning of a customer is sitting at home on their couch, and they don't have any groceries and they don't have time to go to the grocery store to like from that beginning to the end of they actually have their groceries and they're able to start cooking. What happens between the beginning and the end? What are all the activities that the customer has to do? What are all the activities that your business has to do? What's the communication between the two? What is the delivery actually look like? Um, like end to end, you want to understand like, what is the user experience for that entire life cycle, that entire product? And then you can start to drill into like, oh, well, I, I think what's really important is customers need to be able to do it um, from home. They need to be able to, like realistically, if I'm ordering groceries, I need it to be at my house within two hours. Um, anything later than that, it's just not super helpful to me. Unless if I'm thinking about like, I just need to buy staples. Like I need to buy some rice. I need to buy some paper products. I need to buy just the things that I just want to have around. So there's kind of different use cases. Like, are you trying to do the on-demand thing? Or are you trying to do the, I just need to stock up my pantry for the week? Like what's your use case? Um, and from there, like your product is going to vary a lot. And all the features that you put in your product are going to vary a lot based on um, what you want that end-to-end -end user journey to look like. So, so story mapping, user mapping can be super helpful to, to figure that out. Great question, Alice. Thanks. Let's see, another question. So are there ideal or standard user response percentages that one can compare his or her response percentage against noticing UX problems? Uh, yeah, so not really. Um, it all depends on your product. I mean, there's patterns that window work. I think like UX, there's, there's basic UX standards that you can follow, but in terms of what the actual percentage completion rate or percentage drop off, nobody's gonna give you that information. Starbucks can't give you that information. Um, any other company that's very proprietary, like in-house uh, intellectual, properties that they're not going to tell you any of those drop off rates. So don't even try to look for it. You're not going to find it. Um, but there are patterns that you know work and don't work. Like you know that um, if you have a, if you're trying, if you want somebody to complete a form, they have to be able to have a button to submit that form. And that button, if it's going to have copy in it, the button, the copy needs to be readable. It button needs to look like a button. It needs to actually be like something that I am drawn towards tapping. Um, you want to make sure contrast is high. Enough. Like there's, there's various like standards in terms of user experience to follow um, that 
can help you in terms of like, should I do this or should I do that? But in terms of like the actual benchmark data, you just won't find that. Sweet, yeah, it looks like Alice posted a link for story mapping. Yeah, super helpful. We do that on a pretty regular basis. Definitely really good when you're early, early stages on building a product that doesn't exist. Cool, fantastic questions. Anything else? I think we're, we're approaching time, so I just wanna make sure if anybody has another last question. Yeah, thanks, Harsha. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure, everyone. I uh, really appreciate you jumping on. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, you had great feedback uh, in talking about UX changes and hypotheses, so good work on that. Um, if you have any further questions, if you could pass them on to the five one team and they can they can ask me and I can maybe just put together sort of a consolidated email. Um, otherwise, I can share out this presentation with you as well for reference and it has um, helpful links um, in the appendix. Um, I think I showed a few of them are um, one is for a framework for problem solving and identifying your problem. Another one is an overview of A-B testing and one another one is an overview of usability testing. But uh, but yeah, thanks so much. Um, I, uh, I really appreciated talking with you. Great, thank you so much, Josh. This was really informative and really exciting. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning, a recorded version of this webinar will be shared throughout our uh, social media. Uh, and I will, be, uh, I will make sure to send it out to all of you uh, tomorrow morning our time, Josh. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we'll have this session every single month. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.